Thank you, everyone. I would like to call up Dana Eidsness, the Governor's Senior Anti-Hunger Policy Advisor, who will be introducing our speaker this evening. Thanks, Allison. I was saying earlier that um, the World Affairs Council of Maine is responsible for much of my career up to this point. Um, I used to ditch classes at Portland High School to go to World Affairs Council meetings and events at the Unitarian and Universalist Church in Portland. So good evening, friends. Um, I joined Governor Mills Policy Shop back in February. And in this new role, I have the privilege of coordinating the implementation of Maine's Roadmap to End Hunger by 2030, which aligns with the UN's Sustainable Development Goal number two, Zero Hunger. This is a comprehensive strategy developed under the leadership of Commissioner Beal and her staff at the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry and informed by the contributions of over 200 Mainers from Maine's cabinet agencies, business community, nonprofit organizations, food security network, agricultural community, and most importantly, by people with lived experience or living with poverty and food insecurity in our state. So this roadmap is a, is a two-part plan um, that aims to feed people where they are today with nutritious, culturally appropriate food sourced locally as much as possible, and to deliver this food consistently with supply chains and distribution in place to ensure that Mainers have enough to nourish themselves every day. The second part of the roadmap takes on almost everything else in Maine's economic development space. It's about well-paying jobs, access to childcare, access to health care affordable housing, and transportation. All the things that go into making a dignified and healthy life for people and their families. Hunger is a symptom of poverty, and to beat it, we need to take on the systemic issues that hold hunger in place. So rising costs of food, housing, childcare, and other basic household necessities are creating barriers to financial stability for many Mainers which also keeps food security out of reach. This is true throughout the US, and according to the US Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service, currently 34 million households don't have enough food to meet their needs, greatly affecting their health, well-being, and quality of life. In 2020, as the pandemic took root, 60 million people, 60 million Americans, almost one in six, turn to the charitable food system for health. In Maine, we've identified 11.4% of households in the state are impacted, or over 153,000 people a year. That's roughly equivalent to the combined populations of Maine's four largest cities. Over 18% of Maine's children, almost one in five, are impacted. And there are five counties in Maine where one in four children are impacted in Washington, Aroostook, Somerset, Piscataquis, and Oxford counties. These numbers represent people. People living, working, growing up, and growing old in every community in Maine. And it's important to note that 43% of food insecure Mainers don't income qualify for supplemental nutrition assistance, or SNAP, which was formerly known as food stamps. This is the nation's largest domestic food and nutrition assistance program for low-income Americans. They're working, they earn too much money to qualify for SNAP benefits, and still can't afford to put food on the table. These are people you see every day. 33% of Maine's home health aides are food insecure. 42% of single parents, 22% of restaurant workers in Maine, 17% of Maine's grocery store workers. And food insecurity rates are two to four times higher in certain communities in Maine and among certain demographics. Almost 52% of African immigrants are food insecure in Maine. 28.3% of peop all people of color and 49% of people with a disability that prevents them from working are food insecure in Maine. It's unacceptable. 
Maine's Ending Hunger by 2030 roadmap addresses these urgent issues and will reframe the narrative of hunger and food insecurity as a collective responsibility that impacts all Maine people. I've been on the job for a few months now and I've assembled an advisory committee to help implement the roadmap and there'll be a stakeholder group to continuously inform our work. This work will empower and include impacted people and we're gonna bring an equity lens to everything we do. There is good news in all of this. We live in a state that was first in the nation to constitutionally recognize food as a right for all people and that was among the first to implement permanent universal free school meals for children. And we know what works. During COVID, the United States responded with emergency allotments to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, dramatically increasing benefits for many Americans. And we sent out federal child tax credit payments to all Americans, or all US families, during that time in the US. During that time, we cut childhood poverty nearly in half in only six months. The SNAP emergency allotments and child tax credits have ended this year, and we're now seeing food insecurity rates and child poverty on the rise again. We know how to fix this. Meanwhile, the food shortages and logistics challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic the impacts of climate change and world conflicts are creating challenges worldwide. And we're feeling those impacts in Maine. A few thoughts I'll leave with you. Um, the first being that world conditions are interconnected. What's happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola is impacting us here in Portland. Deficiencies and struggles in global supply chains and food production impact everyone. Next, <laughs> hunger in the United States is a policy choice. Through our pandemic response safety net programs, which were temporary, we know that policy measures can quickly and dramatically reduce poverty rates and hunger, ending needless suffering for our citizens and their families. What we allow will continue. To tackle the urgency of ending world hunger, comprehensive approaches are required, including investment in agricultural development, rural infrastructure, social safety net programs, climate resilience, and sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Strengthening international cooperation, promoting equitable access to resources, and addressing the root causes of hunger are crucial in achieving lasting solutions worldwide. Our aim is that Maine can be a model of success in this work. So thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly tonight about Maine's work in the anti-hunger space. Um, it's such an honor to be here, and at this time I have the, the great privilege of introducing and welcoming our keynote speaker to the stage. Daniel Gustafson serves as the special representative of the Director General at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. From 2012 until his retirement in 2020, he served as De Deputy Director General of the organization. He has over 40 years of international experience working on approaches linking science and policy for food and nutrition security, sustainable agricultural transformation, and capacity development. Dan joined FAO in 1994 in Mozambique and subsequently ser served as FAO representative in Kenya and Somalia India and Bhutan, and as head of FAO's Washington DC office before moving to FAO's headquarters in Rome. He also worked in Brazil for the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, IICA, and served as program manager of the International Development Management Center at University of Maryland. Dan holds a PhD in Agricultural Extension from the University of Maryland, a Master of Sciences in Agricultural Economics, and a Bachelor of Science in Economics and International Relations from the University of Wisconsin. In 2015, he was conferred a PhD honoris causa by the Akira Njiranga Agricultural University called Angrao in India. He's here tonight to speak with us about the new urgency in the fight to end world hunger. Dear people, please give a warm welcome to Daniel Gustafson. Okay, well, thanks uh, very much for that a very kind 
uh, introduction, Dana, some of you, I, I hope all of you, uh, heard us yesterday on the main calling. It was a, a really good program that Dana and I were on on the issues of hunger, both in Maine and globally. And it was uh, fascinating, really, to uh, compare notes and at the uh, listen to what uh, is happening in Maine and what Dana is now working on. It's just a, a real uh, privilege to be here uh, and speak. It's just uh, a delight to be here in uh, Portland and see some old friends and uh, be able to speak to you. The uh, title was chosen by Allison, and I think it could not be more appropriate in um, the idea of new urgency in the fight against uh, global hunger. And why? Why new urgency? Right? Why or a renewed urgency? Why? Uh, what's going on? And I think in a nutshell, and I've, I've got uh, a graph to show this in just a second, the world was making really good progress from about uh, 2000 to 2014, 2015, during the period when the Millennium Development Goals were, had been agreed by the member states of uh, the UN, and the goal was at that time to cut hunger in half by 2015. And the world did not make it to half, to cut it in half, but it came quite close, actually. Uh, and I'll show, I'll show that in the slide in a second. Uh, but then, uh, contrary to expectations, it stopped declining. And uh, it, was, it remained about where it was until COVID hit. And COVID was just huge in its impact on food security. And we expect, of course, that COVID would have a, a, a huge impact, but we'll, I hope, unpack that a little bit and see how those uh, consequences of COVID continue to affect what uh, is in fact the economic impact, kind of an economic pandemic of uh, COVID that continues to kind of roil uh, the country. Um, likewise, when we look at uh, what, what is often called acute malnutrition, the kind of localized humanitarian crises of, uh, that we think of in places with drought or conflict or uh, kind of collapse, those have also gone up a lot in that period. And we started to, FAO and together with now 17 other agencies, produce a report every year on global food crises. And the first year that it came out was 2017, based on 2016 data, and it has never gone down. And it looks and is getting worse. And I think that the uh, the question is then, why are we going in the wrong direction? And we'll get into that. That's really kind of the main point of the talk, but a lot of it has to do with inequality, environmental issues, climate change, uh, COVID, uh, and conflict. And uh, I have to say, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree, that this is a surprise to us. I mean, we tend to be, those of us who work in, in uh, international agencies tend to be optimistic because we see lots of success. We see lots of good, good stories and success stories, and we're used to having things improve. Uh, I was talking with Bob Moore earlier about Mozambique uh, and how, uh, how much Mozambique has, has improved. It's fantastic. Yeah, uh, since I, I, I worked there in, when I, in starting in 1994. It's really kind of a different world. And most countries have, in fact, improved a lot. The uh, least developed countries, the World Bank classifies countries in middle income, upper income, low income, there are only 27 low income countries now. And there are, at least in FAO, we have 192 uh, member countries. 27 of those are low income. Everybody else is middle income, and it's in some ways a surprise to us to see how much progress there was. However, uh, certainly we hoped for more by this point in reducing hunger, uh, but we are really surprised by 
this lack of progress. And I think looking at the, at the underlying causes, which are really quite uh, uh, important and uh, problematic and very serious is, I think, what the explanation is. And it is time. It's always been time. There's always been urgency to, to eradicate hunger. But there we really need renewed uh, commitment and, and think through. Um, we just have not, I think, kept pace in spite of all the good work, in spite of a lot of innovation, including policy, like uh, those that Dana mentioned in countries, a lot of innovations, uh, funding has been reasonably good. In spite of all that, we were not making any progress from about 2014 onward, and now we are in uh, really uh, a dramatic decline, and, and, and I'll get into that uh, very quickly. So before we get into the into the, the numbers, just a, a little bit of background to kind of make sense of some of them. The idea of measuring uh, food insecurity or hunger and a commitment to reduce it or to eradicate it, it's a relatively new thing. Uh, 1996 World Food Summit in Rome was the first time that the country's uh, uh, heads of state, uh, it was a summit, heads of state and government got together to agree to cut hunger in half by 2015. That was then rolled into the Millennium Development Goals in, that covered the period from 2000 to 2015. And as I mentioned, there was just a lot of uh, progress on that. And I'll show you on this slide uh, what it looks like. And you can see, I'm not sure I need the pointer because this one is actually pretty straightforward. But you can see uh, this is the percentage, and that's the number. And if we were going to reduce it by half, we would have gotten down to 6.5%, we got down to 7.8%. Poverty, which was another element of the Millennium Development Goals, more than reduced by half. And then, you know, from this period here to here, not much happens. Uh, we kind of run out of steam there, and then it shoots up from 2019. This is the latest numbers we have from 2021 shoots back up to 9.8, and we didn't have 9.8 until back here in about 2006. Uh, so that really is, a, is quite a severe uh, uh, deterioration. So the World Food Summit 1996 agrees on kind of a definition of food insecurity that has elements of availability. Is there enough food in the marketplace or produced? access to people, are they able to afford it? Are they able to reach it? Also an element of utilization, is it food that they can absorb that's, uh, let's say, uh, in line with their um, culture and so on? And is it stable? Is it sustainable at that, at that uh, level? Then um, just a couple of words on how we measure this. The, uh, it's a, it's a, I think, quite a good indicator because it uses, it's called the prevalence of undernourishment, and it utilizes kind of the least amount of information that's readily available that can be calculated essentially every year for every country. And it looks at how much food is available in the country and what the distribution of income, the demographic distribution, and kind of how that plays out. Uh, and then out of that, you come up with an estimate of the number and uh, percentages of undernourishment that's updated as we get more information from the countries. And uh, there's a slide I'll get to that shows how we update that. Uh, and it is reasonably OK. Then, I mean, it's, I think it's remarkable that we can do it, given how complicated this could be. Then uh, after that success in Millennium Development Goals, a lot of the countries, Latin America in particular, who did remarkably well. They got down to, or I think South America, I'm not sure it was for all of uh, Latin America, it got down to 4.2%. And we considered in FAO below 5% for a country was kind of the goal. If you get below 5%, that's kind of, you haven't eradicated hunger, but it's, there's a remnant that needs, always going to need support. And they got down to 4.2%. And they said, look, this idea of cutting hunger in half, what about the other half? We need to eradicate. We need to eradicate hunger. And they passed a resolution among themselves 
uh, in, I think, 2013 to eradicate hunger, and that was then rolled into the Sustainable Development Goals of, that came out in 2015. Uh, I wouldn't say overly optimistic. I mean, I don't know that people really thought we would eradicate hunger, but there was a lot of momentum to go more than cutting it in half. It looked like, don't mess around. E eradicate hunger. And it was led largely by Brazil and some other countries that had made remarkable uh, success in that. And in that, at that same time, then for uh, sustainable development goals, they also created a new indicator called the Food uh, Insecurity Experience Scale, building on the experience of the US that uh, USDA has in questions on how uh, to a statistic sample of the country or the state that asks in you know, a relatively few questions, eight in our, in our case, um, how severe your level of food insecurity is, and they created an indicator of moderate food insecurity and severe food insecurity. Severe food insecurity is when you have run out of food, really, and you don't know where it's coming from, uh, moderate is where you go throughout the year at times where you don't have enough to eat, you miss meals, uh, and you are uh, always kind of worried about it. Um, that also has the advantage, as it will come up in a minute, also has the advantage of being able to separate between, differentiate between men and women uh, and other things that, that turns out to be, I think, a particularly uh, important uh, aspect as we, as we go forward. Okay, so then uh, one of the reasons that the, that the graph, that the line tapers off in 2014 is due to China. And this is the graph. We updated, FAO updated the data on China with new information on distribution of income. And this is the line for, this is uh, with the new numbers, with including China, and you can see that's what we thought the graph looked like globally, or did, that's what the graph looks like globally. But if you take out China, this is what it looks like. So that difference between the kind of orangish brown and the green is the contribution of China. And China just made fantastic progress over that period in eradicating and in, in diminishing uh, hunger, eradicating rural poverty, and diminishing hunger. And that pretty much runs out of steam uh, right about here in like 2010 because they've they pretty much achieved what they were after. It's just a phenomenal achievement for China that I think uh, we don't think about so much anymore. But you could also see, even if you take China out uh, of the equation, we're still making pretty good progress here from 2005, it's still coming down, coming down, and then in 2014 it stops and then it starts going up again. And this is pre-COVID. Right, so what's happening? And there I think what we see, and that's kind of the, maybe my conclusion here, is that we see increasing uh, impact of conflict, climate, and uh, inequality on kind of what's remaining. And then this with COVID just really kind of, uh, really kind of took off. Then if you look at, I should probably emphasize this because uh, we think of the, the uh, undernourished globally as such a huge portion of the population, but you know the non-undernourished is uh, 7.1 billion, right? Uh, I mean, the number, the 768 million is the midpoint. Sometimes you see numbers like 858. It's because we, when the first year comes out, it's in a range. Later on, we, mod we improve it a little bit. But the undernourished, 768 million, far too high. But don't forget, we have 7.1 billion who are not undernourished, as you can see. In, uh, most of those are in Asia and Africa. A lot of Asia is uh, still in South Asia, Pakistan, India, uh, now Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Myanmar, and others, and in uh, Africa that is the uh, uh, other large uh, contributor. Uh, then we get into COVID. And uh, COVID was expected to have a big impact. But at the beginning, that impact, and I, th I think maybe all of us thought this, 
would be on not having availability of food. We saw it here. Uh, the farmers were dumping milk. You couldn't get toilet paper. Now that it was a food item, but it was this supply chain business that stopped everything, and it looked like this is going to be really bad. There's not going to be availability of food. That didn't happen. The other uh, uh, worry was that countries, as in 2008 in the food price crisis, it wasn't really uh, a supply crisis. It was a record year also, but countries, kind of a domino effect, started to, to prohibit exports, and then everybody, they were worried they weren't going to get, were going to have enough food, so then they've stopped their exports, and it just kind of rolled over, and then there was really a shortage in a lot of countries that lasted for a little while, and there was a, a worry that this would also happen with COVID. That also didn't happen, I think, due to improvements in the way that countries uh, through FAO and a consortium, including USDA and others, put together this agriculture uh, market information system so you, you don't let that happen. Um, and that didn't happen either. So we think, okay, maybe we're going to be not so bad here. But in fact, what we had was the great lockdown. And this was just a devastating impact on lots of the world, and especially those who could least afford it. If you think here, for example, in the US, that we buy our food in supermarkets, supermarkets stayed open, and a lot of our supermarkets are really big. Walmart is a supermarket. You know, you could live in, you know, you, do, you could buy pretty much everything you need in a Walmart, and it's still open. Whereas for most of the world, in the countries that have the highest food insecurity, they buy food in the local market, and the local market looks like an incubator of COVID, so they shut those. People who sell the food lose their income. People who buy the food can't buy the food there. They have to go to the supermarket or some other place, and they pay more. Their income goes way down. And uh, there were just a lot of other repercussions. Schools closed. 39 billion school meals were not served during COVID. Uh, the uh, impact on um, so many things that spun off from that uh, are just, were just devastating on food, on food security, but not because of, of, let's say, the reasons that were anticipated, but because of this economic impact. The countries that were poorest, let's say, or not the countries, the, the, the lowest 20% of the world's, uh, the, let's say, the least, the poorest 20% of the world's population lost about twice as much as the top 20%. And the top 20% is really big. It's not like, you know, fat cat billionaires. It's the top 20% of world uh, income. Uh, they lost proportionately much less, and it was uh, the, those that could least handle it were the ones that suffered the most. Uh, and not only that, but the recovery after that was also very uneven. And interestingly, in the next slide, and there are, there are unfortunately, I think, too many numbers here uh, to show, to make sense of. But if you look, the, the region that suffered the most in between 2019 and 2021 was South America. Not Central America, not Sub-Saharan Africa, but South America, urban, very middle income. And they went from, if you look at the uh, prevalence of moderate or severe food insecurity, they went from 30% to 40%. You know, it's a, it went up by a third. Whereas for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, they went up from 57, 58% to 63%, which is a serious problem. But South America is the one that suffered the most. And the reason they suffered was because of, uh, it was much more impact, because of the impact in urban areas and the impact of the informal sector. So if you're in the formal sector, you probably have some kind of, you know, some kind of uh, keep your income, like, you know, essentially like we did, uh, or you would have some, uh, you're also probably uh, wealthier, but if you're in the informal sector and you are, uh, don't really have any employer except what you do during the day, and you're cut out from that, uh, you're in big trouble. And that's exactly what happened. 
The impact on poverty was huge. Uh, the impact in sub-Saharan Africa on the urban population was about 15, was about 44 percent. The impact in rural uh, Africa was about 15 percent, so much less. An urban phenomenon, informal sector, uh, just the repercussions just rolled through and were devastating and continue to be devastating. On uh, this one, again, it's, it's sort of the same issue, but now with the prevalence of undernourishment. This was their low point, 4.2%. Again, 4.2%, they're kind of there. This was, you know, it should be zero, but okay. If you get under five, you're okay. And it's almost a double that with COVID in South America, which is uh, among the most developed of the, uh, let's say, outside of uh, North America and, and Europe. And this slide, the next slide, is, I think, particularly uh, telling in that this is what happened. This is what they lost, the poorest 20%, uh, and this is the richest 20%. And what happened in the recovery in 2020, they go down 6.6%. 6 6 .6 in 2021, they're still going down. They're worse off in 2021 than they were in 2020, whereas um, the fourth quint uh, uh, quintile had a bit of an improvement, and the uh, richest 20% had quite a significant improvement. And But between these are the bottom, these two are the bottom 20, and the bottom, uh, the next one up, the bottom 40% had either no recovery in 2021 or they went down in 2021. So um, what happens in, when we think of like a, a disaster, drought, Somalia, Northeast Kenya, uh, when you're a pastoralist family and you have a drought, what we want to do is maintain your livelihoods so that you don't sell off your flock. Once you sell off your flock, you're done. You're going to go into the town and you're never coming back, probably. You just have lost all your assets. And I think also in the case, you're just not gonna be able to rebuild that herd. And I think in the case of urban uh, informal sector, including in the US, the, not, the, working non, the working poor are the ones who had to shed uh, assets or forego other things to make ends meet fairly well, and we're still seeing that now as the, sub, as the extra funding has stopped, and that's just a trap that's real hard, to get, real hard to get out of. So then we look at what's coming, and this is just a tragedy. So this is uh, in the current Sustainable Development Goals. The goal is to reduce it in half by, or eradicate it by 2030. In 2030, we will end up most likely uh, I think in a somewhat optimistic scenario, we will end up where we were in 2015. This nobody expected, that we would end up at the end of the Sustainable Development Goal period where we started. You know, maybe slow, slower progress than we were thinking with a dip during COVID, but to go over that Sustainable Development Goal period without any progress, this calls for a renewed attention. We ought to think about this and understand uh, what's happening. Okay, then just very quickly, and this is too much information to look at, but I thought the visual would be good. When you look at the economic or the uh, uh, humanitarian crises, we also since about uh, 2015, 2016, uh, uh, have come up with a system for, let's say, agreeing on how bad different crises are. So is the crisis in Sudan worse than the crisis in South Sudan or in Somalia? And how do you know? And how do you compare? So if you're a donor uh, and you want to give humanitarian money, where do you give it if you want to give it where the worst need is? So there are 17 agencies that get together and share their data along a set of criteria that range from on kind of the severity of the crisis that are classified in five phases. First one, none, marginal, nobody talks about phase one. Phase two is stressed, you have to kind of pay attention. But really what we're looking at is phase three, four, and five that ends in, phase five ends in catastrophe and famine. 
phase four emergency is really bad, and phase three crisis is also bad. It's not like, oh, we have to prepare. Uh, the phase three, you're in, you're, you're in need of a lot of humanitarian assistance. Phase four, more extreme. Phase five, famine. And uh, when you look at, and this comes out uh, every year, we keep track of it as, as we go. I think it's a real a advance in that. Uh, when you look at, at the latest report for 2022, these are the number of people that are in phase three, crisis or above, according to the primary driver of that crisis. And you see, normally in 2018, uh, onward, uh, conflict and insecurity is the biggie, right? You've got 21 countries, 73 million, economic shocks, 10, 10 million. You get up here, and now you've got, um, for economic shocks, you've got 27 countries that are in where the main driver of their humanitarian crisis is economic. And uh, it's just something that we haven't seen before. And the numbers, of course, uh, go up all the time. Uh, this is uh, when you look at this slide, again, it's a lot of information, but you can see in the various phases, the only one that kind of bounces around is phase five in uh, 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 famine and catastrophe, because you don't always have a famine in a given year. Uh, we had uh, a lot more in 2021, not very much in some of the other, other years. But when you look at uh, like phase two and phase three, they're really moving up. And uh, phase four, not so much, but it's this group here that is really vulnerable. And I think that's what we are seeing also with this, uh, with these reasons, for these reasons. And then just a couple of um, final slides on this. So if you look at kind of what's behind this, this is a graph on, uh, from UN High Commission on Refugees, number of displaced people worldwide. You know, we didn't think that things were good between 1990 and 2010. I wouldn't have guessed that they were flat. But from 2010 onward, you know, we're talking a uh, pretty steep shift here. Uh, and that's, you know, uh, refugees, in, and I think it includes, I think it includes, I don't think it includes internally displaced people. When you look at uh, extreme weather events, likewise, um, it's, you know, uh, it's just shooting up, uh, and uh, especially with flooding, which is clearly a consequence of climate change. Similarly, droughts are somewhat more, um, let's say, up and down, but the extreme weather events as a, con as a let's say, an indicator of or a consequence of climate change are the ones that are, are really uh, shooting up. So the, um, maybe one final point on this is that, that I mentioned earlier on women. Women suffered the most. And this is, I know, not a surprise uh, probably to anybody, but the difference between the severe and moderate food insecurity before and after COVID was really stark. And women suffered the most uh, for obvious reasons, um, I, I think, you know, for what they had, to, the extra burden that they had, loss of income, uh, and other things, and their, uh, uh, their situation became much worse. It is not by any means all bleak in what countries did to respond to this. Uh, India, for example, has a a relatively new program where everybody in the country, every single person has a bank account uh, that the government can send electronically money to, and 85% of uh, rural households got money and 46% of urban households got money. Brazil, which had, since Lula's time, a big social protection program, ramped that up, and their uh, level of severe uh, poverty below that's below the equivalent of $2.15 uh, a day, actually went down during COVID because of that additional supplemental income along the lines that uh, we know here from, from, uh, from the US. So we've got um, 
to deal with this, a lot of uh, what we thought we knew is still correct. We need women's economic empowerment. We need economic development. We need economic growth. We need uh, pro-poor growth. We need pro-poor policies. We have to deal with climate change. Uh, all the things that we knew, uh, it isn't like we were doing the wrong things. I think we were actually doing the right things, but it wasn't enough. And we never thought it was enough, but we didn't think it would be uh, so much not enough that we would not have made any progress from during the sustainable development goals. So it, you know, uh, I think almost everybody, I think, who works in kind of the development sphere is an optimist, right? Because, uh, you know, you just see progress and you want to be optimistic. And if you're not optimistic, you know, you, you don't know what's going to go. But this is a challenge, even for optimists. This is a really a uh, severe challenge that will get worse because of climate change and because of the economic impact that continues to ripple through, including in the U.S., for the families uh, that Dana mentioned, uh, as, it, as it will elsewhere. And we see the rise of conflict that, while we thought was bad before, is in fact on the increase. And on top of that, also I didn't mention inflation in Ukraine, but the inflation uh, impact, mostly of COVID that we see in this country, and uh, in some countries, the impact of on food supply from, uh, if they were big importers from Ukraine, also had an impact. And the cost of food going up can only be another disaster. So, you know, we remain, I think, uh, certainly convinced that we can address this, but it's going to take renewed ur urgency. It's going to take new urgency, and I'm delighted that I could uh, share these with you. I'm really pleased to be here and meet, uh, meet everybody that I've met so far, and uh, thank you for coming. And I think we have time for questions. Where's uh, Allison? Do we have question time? Yeah. Thank you very much for, for your, um, your information and all the graphs and whatnot. Recently, I was reading about something else that really caught my attention. It has to do with agricultural, how we're um, growing things, and the fact that actually the nutrient value of some of our foods is actually going down. And in some, it's, it's almost 20%. And so is this something that is coming into the equation, you know, particularly, you know, iron or protein and like in right. rice and things like that? So I wonder if you could speak about that. Uh, yes. Um, the, and I, I hope this won't become uh, a casualty of, of this, of the numbers that I've shown there. But uh, while things were improving, there was uh, an emphasis, which there always should have been, on healthy diets. And because uh, what we measure in the prevalence of undernourishment is just calories, right? Are there enough calories to kind of uh, keep alive, essentially? But obviously not enough, so we need to have healthy diets. And three billion people in the world can't afford healthy diets. And the cost of a healthy diet, including uh, in the U.S. is real high, and it's gone up a lot. The stuff that is healthiest is, I think, the pieces or the parts of the food uh, shopping cart that have become most expensive, and I know all of us uh, uh, see that. So the idea of healthy diets, uh, I, I think, has to be maintained as a way of addressing the whole picture. And... Um, I don't know that globally we're seeing a decrease in the nutrient content of, uh, of food. I suspect um, a lot of hothouse tomatoes aren't very nutritious, for example. But in any case, the issue of nutritious food is that people can't afford it on a massive scale. Three billion people uh, cannot afford, don't make enough money to uh, afford a healthy diet. And that has to be part of the equation, even though kind of the dramatic increase that we see is really about basic uh, calories. Thank you so much. Um, David Plum here. I, I was commenting with Abigail here that it's a little daunting to look at those statistics, right? It leaves you a little depressed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what little anecdotes 
of hopeful vision might yeah. you leave us with tonight to lift well, our spirits that while it is extraordinarily daunting, there are yeah. pathways. You mentioned Brazil, you mentioned some other, yeah. but yeah. I'd be interested to hear those. Usually that's the message. You know, I mean, population growth will level off uh, as countries get uh, wealthier, girls go to school. In particular, population growth drops. Bangladesh, for example, has done a tremendous job in reducing, uh, in improving nutrition, reducing hunger. Um, when I lived in India, we used to talk about the South Asia enigma, that, you know, how can it be that with India and the rest of South Asia developing really quite quickly, if it weren't for China, we would have thought India was a powerhouse, but their nutrition numbers just didn't go anywhere. And then here's Bangladesh, who, you know, made huge strides by making it a priority. And the countries that have made it a priority have done really well. And uh, I think that we will see also with the increase in conflict in places uh, that aren't used to conflict. I mean, let's say Sudan is, uh, for example, and uh, Ethiopia, I don't know. But other places, uh, other governments, and it's mainly, almost, almost entirely, up to governments and to put in policies and local communities, local NGOs that do the work. But when the country is committed to reducing hunger, it happens. And that was the lesson from 2000 to 2010. And I think um, uh, how that works is not so complicated. I th you know, with social protection like Brazil, with uh, uh, income support, with emphasis on small farmers, women's empowerment, lots of things. When you are serious, training, Bangladesh, lots of other places, when you're serious about reducing hunger, it's reduced. I think, so I think that we will see again a realization that this is not something that's going to improve under the current circumstances without a lot more attention. And I think there was an expectation that the attention that we were seeing between 2000 and 2010 would continue to lower that curve. The Latin Americans, you know, what about the other half? We have to deal with them. So their expectation, and they weren't, let's say, overly optimistic. They really thought they could do this, and they got real close. Uh, and then they just have a huge setback. And the setback is more difficult now because of climate change and the economic impact that continues to roll through the economies. But the lesson is when countries give it a priority, hunger goes down. And I'm sure that that will come back. And I think it's the realization, not that it's gone, but I think it will come back, the realization will come that it's going to take a lot more than what they thought was necessary earlier. So I am actually uh, optimistic, contrary to uh, what it sounded like. But I think we will get back on track. But getting back on track will take us to where we started in 2015, and that's, that's really unfortunate. So, Paul Howe here. One question. Uh, we saw on your graphs how shocks, global shocks like COVID can dramatically impact food security. So we know that shocks are a given. Uh, other shocks are likely to come. What can we do to make our food security more resilient and sustainable and long-lasting? Right, no, that's a, a, a great comment and a great message and a key, and I'm sure it was part of ADRA's policy too, Paul, right? It, to, um, let's say, to maintain livelihoods uh, and to be uh, preparedness for what you know is coming. And when I started to work more on kind of the emergency side when I was living in Kenya, it was a shock to me when you would get the next drought, it was like everybody was inventing the wheel again. Like this hadn't happened before. You know it's happened before. It was only a few years ago. So how do you prepare communities to deal with that ahead of time? And when it happens, what do you do to keep their livelihoods going so that they don't become destitute and then they're not going to go, they're never going to recover? And that, uh, I think, is the, is the key on this. And I think, uh, likewise, as we see more uh, drought, more floods, uh, more severe weather events, 
there's just going to have to be a lot more attention and a lot more um, development assistance uh, loans in particular to put those systems in place. We're much better at early warning than we were before. We're much better in protecting livelihoods than we were before. Uh, the humanitarian community has come a long way, uh, but we're going to need funding to do that, and I think that's, uh, that's the way it has to be. Thank you, Daniel. And, and while it is, perhaps the best word is sobering, perhaps I was, sobering is better than depressing, I would say. <laughs> um, thanks, Daniel. Uh, and thanks, Dana, for both of your presentations. You know, hunger does stretch right here from Maine to the world. It's here, it's everywhere. Um, for folks who don't know me, I'm David Plum. I'll be the incoming president here of the board of the World Affairs Council of Maine. Very pleased about that um, and seeing more of all of you in the coming year and years. Um, I want to thank folks for coming tonight uh, to our annual gathering to hear this talk. We've spent, I think, five events now looking at hunger from different angles, and I think it's been a wise choice. It's such an important issue. Um, and we're going to be trying in the World Affairs Council to be focused on critical issues like this and really galvanize attention here in Maine and elsewhere. So stay tuned. We look to do good things this year. Um, I want to thank everyone that helped make this possible. So I need to read this so I don't forget names, um, particularly the host committee, which was named earlier. Thank you, everybody, and Jackie and everyone for making this possible. Really appreciate that. We have sponsors, CMP, Verrill, and Vertical Harvest. We really thank them. Um, of course, Hannaford is our event patron, and we're here in Hannaford Hall, so it all comes together, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> so we really are thankful for that. Um, and Jackie, a special shout out to you for taking on this uh, planning, and we really appreciate that. We've had interns, we've had all kinds of people helping out. Um, Maddie Morrison, Anna Wallace, Joyce, as always, Joyce Jang, very helpful. Dory French and Nat Whitney. Everybody rolled up their sleeves um, to try to pull together an evening. Um, so I want to say thanks to all of you.